welcome back. Uh, in this video, we'll be looking at advertising and some other stuff. Okay, so stay tuned. Well, advertising, as the name suggests, it's a malware advertising, which means uh, through the advertising um, objects uh, that you see, uh, the malware is going to be piggybacked behind it and you end up getting them. Okay, so the advertising can be used as a medium to spread malware. Okay, and sometimes just viewing can affect your system as well. Uh, about 10 billion ads were malvertisement in, back in 2012. This has been uh, reduced significantly uh, through the efforts by uh, large IT companies like Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and so forth. Um, so here's an example. In 2017, Google blocked about 79 million ads with redirections and removed 48 uh, million ads trying to install unwanted software. However, you can see that um, Although it, uh, the number of mail, uh, advertisements that's been removed is in millions, um, we have billions of um, mail advertisements uh, that are active and not always they can detect them. So we still have to be careful and try to implement detection, protect, uh, detection mechanisms and protections against those. Okay. So mail advertising can... Uh, get into our system in various ways. So this can include things like pop-up ads, uh, web widgets, uh, hidden iframes, uh, malicious banners, third-party advertisements, and so forth. So all the way that people thought about doing the advertisements, malwares can be attached to them as well. So let's have a look at an example. Here is an example web page. You can see a few ads and whatnot. Which one do you think is a malvertisement? Okay, good guess. If you guess this one, then you're absolutely correct. So you may guess it might be all of them uh, and maybe none of them. And they're all valid guesses because the point is that we're not going to be sure which one where the malware is going to be attached to. And as example before, the iframe itself can be hidden from the web page, which means you're not even going to see an ad uh, where the malware is coming in from okay so how does it work okay so here we are as users what we do is we visit web pages like the ones that we saw before right so that's what's going to happen users visit a site uh, this can be legitimate or bogus it doesn't matter okay because where the mail advertisement comes from is from another person uh, place because when um, the website hosts uh, advertisements what they normally do is they outsource the adverts, right? So for example, you put on a Google ad, for example. Um, what, uh, what users see, what kind of ads the users see would differ based on user preferences. So same with um, uh, whether it's legitimate or not, they will outsource the ads, right? And so the ad hosting is done, uh, is outsourced from a third party uh, to generate revenue. Okay, so what the third party do is sends uh, the ads to display. However, uh, this will also contain uh, malware. And unfortunately, these third parties, then they also could be a victims of sharing those ads. So there is some lack of traceability here, who created those ads, which contains malware, but eventually, these ads get displayed uh, on those uh, sites. And as you view them, uh, they can infect your system depending on whether uh, it's targeting your system or not. Okay. So the advertising can be hidden from the user by creating invisible boxes, which is uh, even more uh, troublesome because you don't have any visual um, inspection of what you can see or what you're not. Okay. So how can we prevent ourselves from um, advertising? Well, keeping up to date uh, software and OS uh, is the best way to do so because the way those mal malwares infect you through the uh, viewing is they scan your uh, software and operating system and to find vulnerability that can be exploited. Okay, so as long as you don't have those vulnerabilities, uh, which can be removed by patching or keeping up to date, 
uh, then you should be able to uh, mitigate a lot of them. Okay. Also, antivirus and other malware protection methods are useful here because essentially, uh, if they find a hole and get into your system, then your antivirus can detect them and remove them as well. Okay. Uh, there are also further protections provided through the browser, things like browser extensions alerting malware campaigns. So here's an example uh, asking you not to go in there because it has detected that there could be a potential malware advertising. Okay. So hopefully that's uh, malware stuff uh, is me understood. Moving on, spyware. Okay. Spyware, uh, there's a variety of spywares, uh, which includes keyloggers uh, on solid unsolicited, uh, unsolicited uh, commercial software, scumware, Trojan horses, and so forth. So we'll try to cover those items uh, in this one. But firstly, we'll look at um, keyloggers. Okay? So keyloggers, what they do is they monitor actions on your computer and capture uh, those actions and send it back to the adversaries or the attackers. Okay? Uh, this can be either software or hardware. Um, so for example, you purchase a hardware from like an unbrand, uh, it could have some sort of a keylogger, for example. Okay? Uh, strong passwords are no longer effective because whatever you type in, although it looks censored on the screen and through the software, the interactions are recorded, which means uh, those censorship is no longer uh, protecting your uh, sensitive information. Okay? Um, so you can use things like anti-keyloggers, antiviruses, anti-spywares, monitor malicious network traffic, and uh, use security tokens and automatic form fillers. Those can all prevent uh, to certain aspects of keyloggers. So what we'll do here is have a look at a demo. Okay. Hopefully. Everybody can see this. Ah, wonderful. All right. Welcome to that. So basically, I have some code. Um, let me quickly show you. This is the um, keylogger code. I'll extend this. And as you can see, it's not that long. Um, how many lines is that? It's about 35 lines of code, including white spaces. And if you want, I can compact this even further. And this is written in Python. So if you write this in, for example, like C, it can be even smaller, uh, for instance. Okay. And basically what it does is I phrase this such that it's just going to echo back into the terminal where I run this off. But essentially what uh, as an attacker would do is just record stored in somewhere as a memory and send it off uh, through the remote connection uh, to the attacker's um, main place. Okay, um, but for demonstration, I am just going to do basic stuff. Yeah, so here I run it. Python three. Uh, it's it's called keylogger. Keylogger demo. .py. So now it's running which means it's logging whatever I type uh, on this virtual machine. So for example, I open up a document and you already see I deleted it by using the backspace and it has recorded the key backspace. So here I can type, uh, this is another sentence, okay? And even if I press backwards, uh, it records them, so I can see which one I have backspaced and whatnot. Um, okay, so it has been recorded. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to a web page. Okay, this is a live Synergy uh, web page. I'm just going to refresh to show you that this is working. Ta da! Okay, so the Synergy web page is working. So, for example, I have to type in my username and password here to log in to see my power bills, right? So username, and then right here, I'm going to type in some secret password. Okay, and from user's perspective, this is all hidden, uh, nicely done. Nobody's gonna know exactly what 
it is. And it even has the nice screen lock button, which means I'm using a encrypted uh, communication uh, through HTTPS uh, SSL. That's great. However, if we look back at our keylogger, uh, here is username that I typed in in the username field. Okay. And below that, you see secret password that I typed in, in the password form. So although I don't see anything going on here, uh, but um, as a keylogger, it records what I typed in there. So I can probably guess uh, where I'm going. And this one is a simple keylogger. Uh, it doesn't capture like a mouse point. So to fool this, you can move the cursor around using the mouse, then it's going to it's not going to know where you're typing it. However, um, more advanced keyloggers can also capture mouse points as well. So um, that's going to uh, capture exactly where you type uh, what you're doing. Okay. Um, okay. So here's an example of uh, my other demo code which doesn't print out anything into the terminal while it's running, but once somebody finishes doing stuff, uh, all it does is tells you uh, when a new session began, uh, what they typed, and uh, what's the output. Like right? So as an attacker, I can create such files, send it off through uh, to my uh, server, and just delete this file. Then there's not going to be any trace uh, as long as I make the communication very small. Okay, so that's that. So keyloggers can be quite devastating. However, it is still a malware, so you can detect those guys and get rid of them or prevent them from being installed. Okay, so please follow those uh, guidelines to ensure you don't um, uh, install those keyloggers for others. Uh, you will have an uh, opportunity to interact with keylogger code that I just showed you in a lab. Okay, so stay tuned. Moving on, uh, unsolicited, unsolicited software. So unsolicited commercial software are installed without users' intentions. That means you didn't even have an opportunity to say, do you want to install this? Yes or no? Okay, and it just got installed anyway. Okay, uh, and as you uh, usually they may contain spyware to snoop users' activities like the keylogs before. So it is always a good idea to check what you are agreeing to install um, at all stages. And then we have a more specialized area of unsolicited software called scumware. Uh, this refers to any malicious code that enter the system without the user's consent or permissions. Okay, so you didn't even try to install anything, but they just got installed anyway. Um, and they start doing stuff. Uh, I, I guess it's kind of like um, viruses and um, or worms, but scumware is more high, higher conceptual uh, versions of that which can do various other things. Okay, so scumware can significantly change the appearance and functions of websites without permissions. So as you can see, viruses or worms don't necessarily do these kind of things, but scumwares can. Okay, so this captures more categories of different um, uh, malicious activities. Okay, uh, and um, ideally you can use anti-spyware and network filtering to get these um, filtered before they get installed. Uh, however, this can still roam around and try to exploit. Hence, keeping up to date is very important. Okay, and what could they do? Well, harvest personal information. Once they get onto your system, uh, they can access a lot of, um, say, your social media stuff, but also some of your uh, files that you store, what kind of keywords you use, and evaluate uh, your personal state. Okay, and gather all of those uh, informations. And then what you can do is you use these informations to create a highly focused customized social engineering attack. Okay, so all of those are actually quite related. And unfortunately, these type of attacks do happen and they actually work. So that's very um, a critical uh, aspect as well, because as people, people can be quite vulnerable if they get themselves familiarized with the items. So if a if a stranger walks up to me and uh, start uh, asking me to do something, uh, I may not know that person. But if somebody 
I know um, more closely and start asking those questions, I might not have um, further questions and then, you know, give to them what they might ask me to do, right? So harvesting personal information, um, issues are that people trust people too much. Um, for example, Chrome incognito mode still allow third parties to collect data. Uh-huh, yes, that's correct. Facebook uh, listening in on users' conversations. So you saw Mark Zuckerberg uh, on the news a few years back. Um, Microsoft listening on Skype calls. Uh, apps collect your data even you deny permissions and so forth. So if you browse through the news, there are tons of um, software that does these things, unfortunately. And yeah, I mean, I understand that people try to collect some data to create your experience better, but people still people also need to understand that those information can be used uh, for malicious intent as well. Therefore, privacy is very important um, aspect. Okay. So, really, is a question for you: Is this okay or not? Something that you should be thinking about. We'll just finish with the Trojans, okay? Next item, Trojan. Trojan or Trojan horse is different to viruses and worms. They're slightly different, yeah? Uh, they don't infect files and they do not spread. They literally just sit there waiting. Uh -huh. And allow attackers to access user's device remotely. So it's kind of like a backdoor. So Trojans are always highly um, related to backdoors. Essentially, their characteristics are pretty much the same, right? Um, Trojans also has client and server applications so that the attacker can remotely connect and do stuff and tell what the Trojan should do. A user can unintentionally download and install it in, on the system. So this can come through email attachments, file sharing, free softwares online, and so forth. Hence, very important to check the checksums. Okay. Uh, attackers can also directly install them, uh, for example, physical uh, access. So they can just uh, hold on to like a USB, plug it in, install it. You might see um, some movies uh, or TV shows where they work on the victim's phones and install spywares and Trojans. All of those are what well, they try to do but don't really believe what TV shows you. Some, many times they're not really um, what really happens. Uh, nevertheless, is a good example. Zeus back in 2009, uh, not that guy, but yeah, just named Zeus, um, basically stole banking information using Keylogger. Okay, so Keylogger was carried on the Trojan. Um, affected systems through downloads and phishing. So here you can see a lot of different attack techniques gets combined to uh, exploit people's vulnerabilities and also the system. Uh, it did compromise over 74,000 uh, file transfer protocol accounts on websites, um, such as Bank of America, NASA, Oracle, Cisco, Amazon. Yeah, so you can see that even though they are big organizations, they're not going to necessarily um, have uh, protections against something that comes out as new. Okay, so those are these are always a, a interesting area of research. Anyway, uh, Zeus botnet estimated millions of compromised computers, uh, which was the largest botnet on the internet at the time, and also used for installing CryptoLocker ransomware later on. Okay, so Zeus is not just one off thing. People create variants out of that use uh, and use it for different purposes. Okay, so very dangerous. Okay, so how do you mitigate Trojans? Well. Uh, best defense is safe computing practices. Uh, don't trust what you get from the internet. Um, I hope everybody do that. Um, Trojan horses can come from unsolicited executable email attachments from recognized senders as well. Um, email spoofing is very easy to do. Um, uh, we don't cover that in lectures or uh, labs. However, uh, you are all, um, welcome to explore how spoofing works. Okay. Um, use IDS or file integrity monitoring systems. So IDS is an intrusion detection system, which we will cover in later videos. Um, for example, Tripwire is an example. All right, we do have one more item to cover, rootkits, okay? So what rootkits do is 
they look legitimate but conduct malicious uh, behavior. So, um, and they have a specific goal, which is to obtain the root privilege uh, of the system. Okay, and that's the uh, only purpose of those root kits. Okay, um, they have access to modify existing software, so they will do it. Um, uh, if they if it is necessary to gain the root privilege to do so and they can be installed on um, firmware as well as kernel okay um, so the firmware ones are persistent ones where it hides in the firmware which means even if you restart the computer the root kit is going to still sit there and do its stuff okay the kernel mode one is High from kernel list of active active processes. So even if you try to say go to your task manager, trying to kill it, you can't find them there. Okay. And there's a user mode runs along with other application. This is probably the most basic ones, which uh, can be detected quite easily and be removed. Okay. Uh, but as it goes up to the firmware level, they are much harder to find and much harder to detect uh, what they're trying to do. So how do we remove um, or mitigate rootkits? Well, possible to hide spyware, spyware or viruses that will not be detected by traditional antivirus products, which is our problem, right? Um, there are some specific rootkit eliminators like F-Secure Blacklight Rootkit Eliminator. You can have a look at there. Uh, and also there are some published rootkits uh, which you can find uh, and then uh, follow instructions specifically to remove them, uh, but because of because of the rootkit's nature, uh, many times it is very difficult to detect them. Um, uh, so it's all about awareness of what they do and how to go about uh, preventing them. So your OS updates will come with some sort of mitigations uh, where existing ones uh, cannot exploit your system to be installed. Um, but obviously, if we are faced with the new rookets, then um, obvious, uh, the OS systems is going to uh, not be able to protect you against that. Um, so it's a good practice uh, to be secure and um, question everything that you browse through the internet. Otherwise, I think this video got quite long, so I'll stop here and cover some more stuff in the next video. See you later.